Earlier this year, the controversial Oprah interview was watched by 12 million people in the UK and 17 million people in the US and sparked heated debate across the world. It wasn't a complete surprise to hear her feelings. The royal family is just as messed up as everyone else's. I like them and last night made me like her even more. The press just won't leave me alone. She's doing this to be a victim. And to have all the publicity that they want, but they don't want the publicity they don't want. Again, they can't, they can't pick and choose like that. You continue to trash her. Okay, I'm done with this. No, no, no. Sorry, no, uh, sorry. So, do you know what, that's pathetic. You can trash me, maybe but not my No, 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 no. no. I, but what else does that interview reveal to us about the nature of power, monarchy, and the establishment? My previous video covered the events that led up to the interview, so you can watch that to catch up. But if not, here's a basic recap. I'm dating Prince Harry. Megan, it's Harry, not Harry. Oh, Harry. Quick, invade her privacy immediately in a way that would make even Edward Snowden recoil in horror. I'll go harass her father and take pictures of him buying beer and toilets. Look, here's her estranged half-sister. How well do you know her? I haven't seen her for 10 years. I mean, she's a narcissist. Ooh. Um, actually, I didn't mean any of that. You're the best sister ever. Please, can I have an invite to the wedding now? Okay, fine. You're actually the worst person ever. You're an attention seeker who will ruin the royal family. Ooh. The stress of being held at every day by the press means I've had a heart attack. And I'm gonna announce this to my own daughter via the press. Oh no. <laughs> what a narcissist for abandoning her father like that. What did I say? She's such a narcissist. She really needs to be more discreet. She's such an attention seeker. You could start reading the newspapers. There she goes again, being all visible. Okay, well, I'll have my baby in private then. What? We demand to see that baby. What are you hiding? Nothing. Okay, here's one picture. We can't see his face. Show us his face, Megan. We pay 74p a year for the privilege of seeing a random baby's face. Ugh, I give up. We'll move to the US and make our own money instead. How dare you? We were paying 74p a year for you. Do you know how many Freddos I could have bought with that? I'll do an interview so you can hear my side of the story. I thought you didn't want any attention and now you're fannying around with Oprah and you named your baby after the Queen. You hate the Queen. I literally never said that. <laughs> So Meghan and Harry had decided it was time to finally get their side of the story out. As expected, splits were across age groups and political affiliation with multiple accusations of lies coming from the tabloids. So let's have a deeper look into these alleged lies. Three days before our wedding, we got married. Ah. No one knows that, but we called the Archbishop and we just said, look, this thing, this spectacle is for the world. I, I didn't take it as we got married. I took it as we, we had, a, had private a, ceremony, a private ceremony. Kind of. but I very much took it as the idea that they had got married. The use of the word marriage, marriage we got married, was not entirely I meant blessed. accurate. The Archbishop of Canterbury superstitiously marrying a Duke and Duchess, it all sounded a bit far-fetched like pretty much everything else they said. So what Meghan was actually talking about here was a private exchange of vows. So you can't legally be married in the UK without two witnesses and a licensed venue over your heads. So for Meghan to use the word married here was just incorrect. But also, I don't know what people thought Meghan was trying to achieve with this. It seems like an unusual thing to intentionally lie about. I think she just used slightly misleading language here but people did jump on it to add to the alleged list of lies that she told i've never looked up my husband online 
I just didn't feel a need to because everything that I needed to know he was sharing with me, right? Or everything okay. that we thought I needed to know he was telling me. So this is another claim that people found it difficult to believe. People pointed out that she'd written about the royals on her blog, The Tig, which further backed up their claims about her obsessions and plans to become a princess. So I had to search the archived pages of her blog to try and find the post. Oh, you were expecting more? A 10,000 word essay on the history of the monarchy? That was it. But no, she's obsessed, I tell you. Burn the witch. Burn her. So this comes from the generally misogynistic belief that women are manipulators with a master plan and they never say what they really mean. And it's a belief held by both women and men. And if you watch my previous videos on Tony Robbins, you'll see how these toxic beliefs manifest themselves into people's daily lives. You gave him sex, he would let you do anything you want, including gamble. This is not surprising for any man because once a man has had sex, he is vulnerable to anything. He will give anything. But that does not mean he was trading sex for gambling. It sounds like you were the person trading sex for gambling. People make other claims about Meghan being supposedly obsessed with the royals since she was a child because she wore a crown at a birthday party once and this one picture of her draped over the rails at Buckingham Palace. I'm not sure how one visit to Buckingham Palace constitutes as an obsession with the royal family, culminating in a master plan to seduce a prince and separate him from his family whilst undermining the stability of the most powerful monarchy in the world. Here's a picture of me drinking Ribena as a kid at a swimming pool. Does that mean I hatched a plan to overthrow the Ribena Empire by seducing the purple berry mascot and becoming pregnant and giving birth to his little berry children and then manipulating him into abandoning his berry family by claiming I was being discriminated against by the berry community because they tainted their pure berry heritage with my foreign human genes? Then holding a tell-all interview with Berry Oprah in which I reveal that my berry children were being refused the title of his royal juice because they weren't purple skinned enough? And anyway, so what if she did Google him? It wouldn't have made any difference to what eventually transpired anyway. And at least she didn't hire a fucking private investigator to stalk him and all of his acquaintances. Were you silent or were you silenced? So Meghan famously stated that she was silenced by the royal family. This was also apparently a lie because Meghan had been seen in multiple public engagements whilst working for the palace. I don't know how these people expected her to defend herself from tabloid gossip whilst on royal engagements. It has been an absolute honour and privilege to meet the wonderful people in your communities today and I hope that this visit will inspire a long-standing and lasting relationship between our sovereign nations and helping to bring stability and education for all future generations. Oh, and I didn't make that bitch cry. That was the last time until we came here that I saw my passport, my driver's license, my keys. So the main issue here was the passport. Megan says when she entered the palace, her passport was taken off her. However, she's been accused of lying because she was seen traveling abroad for royal duties and personal holidays. Some people happily providing lists of all the places she went while she was a royal. I believe what she meant is that she was allowed out if her trips were pre-approved by the firm, but smaller personal outings such as lunches with friends would be declined because she had been seen too much. So this was clearly the palace's attempt to have her in the tabloids a little less, and I think this was their version of protecting her, as it was clear, evidenced by the events that I outlined in my previous video, that she was being hounded, and a narrative would be drawn by the press about where she's going and why and what she's doing every time she went outside, so that it would fit into this stupid narrative that they'd made of her being a narcissist and desperate for attention. Oh, why is she walking to the gym with a yoga mat? Oh, it must be because she's toning her bum in order to upstage Pippa at her own wedding. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, they would go on the record and negate the most ridiculous story for anyone, right? If I'm talking about things that are super artificial and mm -hmm. inconsequential. 
But the narrative about, you know, making Kate cry, I think, was the beginning of a real character assassination, and they knew it wasn't true. Now, I was curious as to exactly what Megan meant here. I found an interesting piece by Omid Scobie, which, if true, would back up Megan's claim here. So the story about the Sussexes leaving Kensington Palace for Frogmore Cottage was painted in the press as this juicy feud between Megan and Kate. So Scobie says, the couple's exasperation came to a head in January 2020 when Kensington Palace urgently requested that Prince Harry co-sign a statement against an offensive newspaper report stating Prince William constantly bullied the Sussexes before their decision to step away. Well, if we're just throwing any statement out there now, then perhaps KP can finally set the record straight about me not making Kate cry. Megan emailed an aide. But, as with many requests made by the couple, her suggestion was ignored. The Duchess of Cambridge, she was told, should never be dragged into such idle gossip. And remember Jason Nauf from part one? I said I couldn't work out what his deal was. It all seemed very unusual. Basically, three days before the Oprah interview, Nauf leaked an email he had sent two years and five months prior, in which he alleged to HR that Meghan had been bullying members of staff. Then he admitted that he did not co-write the letter Meghan sent to her father, allowing her to win her court case against the Mail on Sunday, and soon after he left his job and the country. Well, for a start, it turns out that members of the staff that she had allegedly bullied did not even know that Jason was reporting this to HR. One other thing that I've learned is that whilst this bullying claim was submitted by uh, the then chief communications officer, the head of comms at Kensington Palace, the staff involved didn't know that it had been submitted. And when they found out, they asked for it to be rescinded. So we've got quite a difficult story here about a bullying complaint. And yet the staff involved, it appears, or so I'm told, didn't even know well, it had been. But it's been alleged that Jason has been notorious throughout his career for being in cahoots with the tabloid press. And it's been revealed in court documents that the Mail on Sunday accidentally copied Meghan's lawyers into an email in which they were practically begging Jason to say that he co-wrote her letter to her father, thereby allowing the paper to argue in court that the copyright belonged to the palace rather than Meghan. It's been alleged that the Cambridges and the palace were consistently using now to help them look good in the tabloids and as soon as he refused to lie in court about co-writing Meghan's letter he was politely let go and now he's moved abroad and guess who Jason Nauf went to school with Dan fucking Wooten editor for The Sun the man who broke the story about Megxit and forced Harry and Meghan into announcing their decision early by giving them a 10 day deadline before he announced it for them and then gave himself a pat on the back whilst calling them professional victims and here he is saying that members of the royal household are the ones leaking stories about Harry and Meghan much of the negativity towards the couple is coming from within the royal family. The royal family and staff of the royal family are the ones that are very often leaking these stories to the press. But it's unfortunately quite evident that the palace has a vested interest in keeping this narrative alive. Harry and Meghan had the potential to be extremely popular and there are claims that the palace was actively attempting to take them both down a peg so the spotlight would not be taken from William and Kate. She really is beautiful, isn't it? They didn't want him to be a prince or a princess, not knowing what the gender would be, which would be different from protocol. Now this was the biggest claim, so I'll explain in full. In 1917, King George V dropped an LP. No, not that kind of LP, but a letters patent, which is a bit like an executive order, but for something which doesn't really fucking affect anyone in the long run, and it's just about stupid made-up fairy tale names for rich people. It limited his, her royal highness titles to the children of the monarch and the grandchildren born by the sons of the monarch. So following this official rule, Archie would be an earl until Charles becomes king, and then he'd be a prince. It should also be noted that except 
conditions and permanent changes are made to protocol all the time. Like I mentioned in the last video, members of the royal family break dress code protocol constantly and they change their official rules for titles constantly because guess what? They don't have to fucking answer to anyone, do they? If I were the queen, I'd give my cats titles and they'd have 12 members of staff each. Your Majesty, His Royal Highness Brooklyn has brought more dead vermin in from the courtyard. Then thank him for his service and put it with the rest. Your Majesty, the, the stench is becoming unbearable. Put it with the rest. Your Majesty, I, I don't think your outfit today really follows protocol. Fuck off. So Meghan is saying that they are preventing Archie and Lilibet from becoming a prince or a princess when Charles is king, despite this 1917 LP written by George V, implying that a future letters patent was going to be issued in which the rules would be changed so that they would be prevented from ever becoming a prince or princess. So Meghan says that she doesn't care about the titles either way, she just wants security. And she says that she was told he wouldn't get it because he would not have a title. So whatever your opinion is on this, it seems that this potential change in protocol, if it happens, could end up being the case for one of a few reasons. Number one, it could be because Charles has previously indicated that he wants to slim down the royal family, thereby reducing the amount of family members being offered senior titles, and this happened to be in discussion by coincidence right before Archie was born. It's possible, but if that's true, Meghan is saying that this was not made clear to her. And why not make that clear to her if that were the case? Reason number two, it could be that Meghan is unpopular. The firm thought that it would be a good way of distancing her and Harry from the family in the future. Reason number three, it could have been over concerns of Archie's skin colour, as Meghan alluded to. These concerns could have been due to the firm themselves not wanting someone of black heritage with a title, or perhaps they were worried about the public perception of someone with black heritage getting a title. If people like this are willing to say it out loud, then how many people out there are thinking it? Maybe it was a bit of all three of these reasons. She also revealed that the reason they didn't do the tradition at the Lindo Wing was because that's reserved only for babies that are future princes and princesses, and she complained that the royal family could have announced that to the public rather than letting her get all the hate for keeping him from them. And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. Yeah, but what colour is your child going to be? And uh, I, I've been in that situation as well. It, it is deeply shocking. Is it racist and offensive for a family member to say, oh, what colour might the baby be? I think there is no doubt that it is a form of revenge. Uh, we're talking about racism here. If those comments were made, if they were made in a derogatory way, we have a right to know exactly who said them and what their reasoning is. So this one has been the subject of a lot of contention ever since, with the pro Megan camps saying it's racism and the anti Megan camps saying it was clearly just an innocent question. We're never going to know, but I'm just inclined to believe that Megan would have not said it like this if it didn't make her feel very uncomfortable. However it was said, however it was dealt with, clearly it made her feel uncomfortable. Can we not take her at her word for that? Apparently not, because our royal family are so fucking perfect and definitely have never done anything racist ever. How dare you suggest such a thing? It's not like the entire concept of monarchy is pervaded by an obsession with blood purity or have a historical role with supporting the slave trade that's never since been acknowledged. No, nothing ever racist could have ever been said in the royal household. Ever. We had to go to an official event. I had just had that conversation with Harry that morning, and it was the next day that I talked to the institution. You had the conversation, I don't want to be alive anymore? Yeah. And the last bombshell was Megan saying that she got to the point where there was a very real and frightening realization that she did not want to be alive anymore and she couldn't get help from the palace. Now there's some people who are saying that they don't believe her at all, that she was never depressed and never suicidal. Other people say that she must be lying because Harry started a mental health charity and other people say that she was lying about being at the point of suicide the night that she went to 
the Cirque Soleil because in the footage of her there, she's smiling. This just goes to show how much still needs to be learned about mental health. And if you watch that footage back from that night, there's actually people booing them in the crowd. Quite frankly, I'm impressed that she survived that ordeal. I think it serves as a testament to her strength that she's still here, sane enough to defend herself, to be quite honest. People have become suicidal over school bullying. Megan was bullied by a entire country. The headlines the next day were predictably unsympathetic, with the Daily Mirror branding it the worst royal crisis in 85 years. Clearly the possible pedo prince of Pizza Express and Perspiration didn't make enough of a dent on their memories for them to warrant marking it in their diaries. Meghan's family didn't go anywhere, with her sister and brother backing the tabloids, calling Meghan a bully and a narcissist, and that Harry is suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. I definitely see a um, narcissistic personality disorder and I'm not I'm not diagnosing her. The month that Meghan and Harry announced that they were stepping down from their senior roles, Thomas Markle's tell-all documentary was released. He seems confused and regularly contradicting himself and telling lies, something which the producers even have to clarify on the show. I called and said I can't come. I could, um, I'm sure Meghan cried was very upset. It also included the cringiest soundbite ever. My daughter told me that when I reach my senior years, she'll take care of me. I'm in my senior years now. I'm 75 years old, so it's time to look after daddy. After the Oprah interview, Thomas Markle was interviewed again on Good Morning Britain, still under the impression that talking to the press would convince his daughter to speak back to him. Piers carries on asking loaded questions to Thomas in order to push his own agenda. Thomas, you, you, you took care of Meghan on your own for years. You know, she came and lived with you yes. uh, for a long yes. time, a long time. And now yes. you're completely estranged. And of course, there is an irony that they've now been doing a series of interviews and pictures to promote their own image and make lots of money out of that, you know, in different ways. What do you feel about that, that you were basically pilloried and shamed for doing, by them, for what they are now doing to promote their own image? Exactly. I think uh, Los Angeles is racist, California is racist, but I don't think the Brits are. Uh, I'm guessing and hoping it's just a dumb question from somebody. It's difficult to say how much of this is Thomas Markle's own fault and how much of this is manipulation of Thomas by the tabloid press. I'm not sure, but whatever it is, it's heartbreaking, I imagine, to hear your own father dismiss your claims of experiencing racism. It's not clear if or when they'll ever speak to each other in private again, but if I were to make a prediction, I think it may well happen once the press intrusion has died down, or if and when Thomas stops doing this, which may take years. And of course, we had the country's loudest, bigoted white man spearheading the subsequent public backlash against Meghan's claims. They got unbelievably positive coverage right to the point where they got married and she disowned her father, who then gave a different portrait of his daughter. From my analysis to the press reaction in part one, it was racist and misogynistic from the start, and there was a positive uptick in the headlines during the one month of the wedding, and then it went straight back into the negative again. Meghan's father was goaded by the press into speaking to her daughter via them, whilst Meghan only wanted to speak directly to him. She did care for him when he was in the hospital, as we know from the texts released in court documents, and she sent him security to protect him from the press while he was there, after which they were told that he refused that security. Which to me honestly sounds extremely sus, because why would he just refuse security? Which makes me think at that point the paparazzi were probably doing that for him. Couple that with the fact that Harry sent him a message saying, this does not not sound like you, Thomas. Very weird. The press manipulated him, you included Piers, into speaking out against his own daughter publicly in the hopes of getting her to respond, knowing full well that it would not work. 
I'm not sure if Piers is racist, but he does seem to be having an exceptionally difficult time understanding the nuances of racism. Discussions about her exotic DNA, her newborn baby. Is her DNA not exotic by royal chin. standards? She was I mean, the first mixed race person to ever enter the royal see, family. Piers, this is the Why is the word exotic? This is the Why do you take exception to the word exotic? Because it others her and associates her with a history. She's an African American joining African a white heritage. royal family. But what I am sure of is his misogyny. I'm sure many women watching this will be able to relate to, at some point in their life, a man being under the impression that they're owed something by her. A smile, a reply to a catcall in the street, a text back, or another date because he was a nice guy. And as soon as you try and politely decline, or even just say nothing, all hell breaks loose and you're a fucking slut bitch. This is what women put up with from misogynistic men. And this is exactly what he is. This is exactly what he is doing. Has she said anything about you since she cut you off? I don't think she has, but yet you continue to trash her. Okay, I'm done with this. No, no, no. Sorry, no. Oh, uh, Sorry. So, do you know what? That's pathetic. You can trash me, maybe not my. No, own, no, no, no. See I'm, you later. I'm being. Sorry, can't this do this. This is absolutely diabolical behaviour. After this clash between Piers and Alex, Piers eventually stormed off and left the show, and after thousands of complaints to Wofcom, including a complaint from Megan herself, Piers had talks with the heads of ITV, and the decision was made for Piers to leave the show. Aww. She then released a children's book called The Bench, after which she was accused of using her royal title for monetary gain, even though other oh, royals have done the same thing. The Express wrote an article headlined, Queen urged to contact publishers now to remove Meghan's royal title from book cover. And after reading this headline, you'd probably think, oh dear, the, the royal courtiers had a problem with her putting her title on the book cover, and they've advised the Queen to contact the publishers now. Nope, if you actually read the article, this is just the result of the paper survey of its own readers. Wow, isn't that surprising that the readers of a tabloid would come to such a conclusion? These stories are now just circle jerks of their own hate, regurgitated for the public to consume again and again. Echo chamber me daddy, spit my own opinions back into my mouth. She was even accused of plagiarizing the book, after which the author of the original book had to verify that there were no similarities between the books whatsoever. So they couldn't pursue that story any further, so then they went with Meghan Markle's fun-free children's book may put an entire generation off reading. So, well done Meghan, our children are going to be illiterate now and it's all your fault. But at least they won't be able to read any shit rag tabloids. Maybe that was her plan all along. Burn her! Burn the witch! Burn her! Harry then went on Dax Shepard's Armchair Expert podcast, in which he spends a lot of time talking about mental health and the detrimental effect that social media is having on society, and how we need to learn how to use it to our advantage instead of using it to amplify hate. Pretty important stuff in my opinion, but of course the only headlines we saw about this were Prince Harry calls the First Amendment bonkers. Again, I don't want to start sort of going down the First Amendment route because that's a huge subject and one of which I don't understand because I've only been here for a short period of time. But you can find a loophole in anything mm -hmm. and you can capitalise or exploit what's not said rather than uphold what is said. Most people weren't going to bother listening to the whole podcast to realise that this was actually within the context of a long discussion in which Dax explains how in the US the First Amendment is used to justify relentless intrusion of people's lives and invasion of privacy for profit under the guise of upholding a free press. And Harry responds that he's not very well educated on the First Amendment, but it is bonkers, meaning the way the First Amendment is exploited by the press is bonkers. But that's not as exciting and clickable as just saying Prince Harry moved to America and called the First Amendment bonkers, is it? And helpfully steers the public vitriol away from the press and towards Harry. He also had criticism for attacking his family and all the tabloids successfully managed to make it sound like Harry was just sat there itemising his family's personal flaws one by one. At a point in time it perhaps wasn't particularly advisable to, to sort of strike out against the Queen and, and Prince Charles even though he did it in, in my opinion in, in, in a 
in an accidental way, he should have thought more about what he was trying to say. The impression that I got from both this podcast and the Oprah interview when he was talking about his family was that he simply feels sorry for his family because they're stuck in a system that they can't get out of and that's caused a sort of generational pain and rifts between them. And one large part of this machine is called the Royal Rota, which is a mechanism that attaches the royal family to the press in a sort of symbiotic relationship in which one side is pretty much held hostage because if they leave the relationship or transgress in any way, then the other will eat them alive. But I also am acutely aware of where my family stand and how scared they are of the tabloids turning on them. So, what is the royal rota? The Royal Rota was introduced 40 years ago. It has core publications in it which are mostly British tabloids, and these tabloids are given exclusive access to royal events. There is an unwritten rule that members of the royal family are supposed to release new pictures to the public via this Royal Rota system, and that this will, in theory, mitigate press intrusion. If you look back at William and Kate's history with the tabloids, you can see how this comes into play. Kate got papped whilst sunbathing topless in France in 2012 and the photos were published in a French edition of Closer, a publication not in the Royal Rota, after which they were successfully awarded damages. They also sued Tatler magazine when one of their journalists, Anna Pasternak, wrote a piece in which she accused Kate of being too thin, among other claims about her being exhausted and stressed after Meghan's departure because of the increased workload. What should be noted here is that both of the publications that Kate and William have sued are not actually part of the Royal Rota. There were many negative headlines about Kate in the early stages of her relationship with William, albeit significantly less than what Meghan was subjected to, and the negative headlines that she did get were nowhere near as bad. But back in 2007, all the press got was a polite request released by the palace to tone it down a bit. No lawsuits or statements since. It does have to be noted that they tried to write sensational stories about Kate, but they had nothing to go off. She got the nickname Weighty Katie because they projected this narrative onto her that she was just waiting for William to propose to her. Not exactly scandalous, but she was young, white, very British, very English, and they had nothing to go at her for. She isn't a 35-year-old divorcee with a career that has involved her being sexualized at times and a history of expressing some left leaning opinions. Kate and William did actually have their phones hacked by News of the World, as well as Harry. Kate and William to this day have not sued for the phone hacking scandal, even though stories that came out to the press as a result of the hacking were plastered across the tabloids everywhere. Harry didn't sue for having his phone hacked until he met Meghan and their relationship with the royal rotor turned sour, and eight years after the fact he actually decided to sue once he decided not to play their game anymore. More. This just goes to show that the royal family are afraid of pissing these people off. Does that sound like a healthy symbiotic relationship to you or a completely toxic one? Does that not go to show that these people are truly stuck in a system and Harry is correct? But no, we should all be annoyed that he called the First Amendment bonkers. Historically, the understanding with the royal rota expects that if their royal highnesses were to release a photo that has never been seen, they would be expected to give the image to the rota, of which four of the seven or UK tabloids simultaneously or in advance of their own release. This formula enables these publications to profit by publishing these images on their website slash front pages. Any breaches in this understanding creates long-term repercussions. You can see this in play here when Charles, William and Harry agree to a photo call in return for the media leaving them alone while they try and enjoy the rest of their holiday. And Charles was caught on the mic saying how he truly felt. But in the modern age of Instagram and other social media, this whole system just doesn't make much sense anymore. The newspapers and the press machine used to be the only way in which you could communicate with your fans. Princess Diana knew this and learned how to use the press to her advantage, even though this relationship would eventually turn sour. But the age of the paparazzi chasing celebrities down the street is just dying away. Most celebrities connect directly with their fans and announce major life updates via their social media, and this has massively devalued 
the pictures of celebrities just walking down the street. Journalists just rehash Instagram posts for the most part. Nowadays, the papped pictures that do appear are most likely tipped off by celebrities' PR or in the world of TikTok and YouTube influencers. They all hang out in the same restaurant that they know the paparazzi are going to be at anyway because they want to be papped to look like they're in demand. But this still isn't the case with the royals. There's still value in candid, non-consensual pictures of royal family members, specifically because of the royal rota, which prevents them from releasing their own pictures online before releasing them to the rota. And also their public silence, or the convention of the stiff upper lip, prevents them from releasing personal life updates or rebuttals of lies in the press via their own channels, therefore leaving the press with a free reign to write whatever narrative they want using their anonymous sources and royal commentators for opinion. When no one, or only very few people actively seeking to control the narrative, has real insight into an issue or topic, there will always be a risk that some publications will settle for anonymous self-interested sources and whoever is willing to provide their insight, or at least express an opinion, as long as it makes for copy. And you might be thinking, boo-hoo, you live in a palace, all you had to do was sit on a rock for a second before you got to go back to your skin holiday. But this is the system which escalates to the press having free reign to publicly bully a woman almost to death because it's profitable. Meghan and Harry's interview destabilised this agreement. Their actions have threatened the tabloid's control over the situation. No wonder they're pissed off. <laughs> When you have a small platform on which you don't have to fact check, there's no checks and balances to answer to, you can basically say whatever you want about a person. And in some cases, if you have a small platform, you can be almost as powerful as the press. I double and triple check everything I say in my videos and provide as many sources as I possibly can in the descriptions of these videos. But I don't have to, and many people don't. Here on YouTube, there are channels dedicated to uploading videos almost every day based on rumour and poorly researched material about Meghan in particular and they love using Lady Colin Campbell as a source as long as it's negative it's posted. When you look at the articles on the Daily Mail and the Sun and the Express you can't see the actual numbers of how well these articles do in terms of clicks but on YouTube you can see that. The information's right there in front of you and when I see the amount of views that these terribly researched, completely half-assed videos get. Honestly, most of them were clearly made in about 10 minutes. <laughs> I just think to myself, why the fuck do I have integrity? Why do I bother double checking and triple checking that my sources are reliable? Why the fuck do I even bother when I could just upload a slew of videos trashing Megan that would take me a fraction of the time to make and make me a hell of a lot more money? And then I realise that's exactly the dilemma that tabloid journalists have. They know their numbers, they see the articles that do well, so they follow the money. Integrity is out of the window, and it has been for a long time. These women that run these channels will rail on her looks, saying that she's ugly, they'll say she's a narcissist, a bully, and they'll cherry pick pictures which they think show Megan being caught in a mask off moment, and over analyse every public appearance that Meghan has made and shoehorn it into a narrative that she is controlling over Harry. As soon as Meghan does something that doesn't fit into their narrative, such as understandably keeping Archie out of the spotlight as much as possible, given that, for example, before his birth, the son went as far as to publish computer-generated mock-ups of what he could look like, bringing into existence the most nightmarish images known to mankind to this day. Honestly, after seeing these images, I'm not sure why anybody wanted to see Archie. <laughs> Can we just have a little peek at him? We just can't quite see his face. Yeah. Keeping Archie out of the papers as much as possible went against the theory that she was an attention-seeking narc. So what did they do? They projected theories onto her that she's trying to hide something. And through this, they came to the conclusion that she used a surrogate and she never personally gave birth. Birth. And some even came to the conclusion that Archie isn't real at all. They call Megan's bump the moon bump because this is a brand of fake pregnancy bumps that you can buy online. There's nothing wrong with having a 
surrogate, but there is a huge problem with taking our money and then telling us lies. This is a Beyonce baby. That's what it is. Has she used the services of a surrogate? Is she genuinely pregnant? She is the one who has created the mystery. She is the one whose conduct is wildly inconsistent and justifiably questionable. Yep, these people aren't just doing mental gymnastics anymore. They're pole vaulting over the truth. This wasn't even just a fringe conspiracy that only the most unhinged haters hatched. Brandwatch did an analysis and estimated that around 1.5 million people probably saw something to do with this conspiracy on their timelines just between January and February 2019. 16% of mentions concerning Meghan's pregnancy in this time related to these conspiracies with hashtag moonbump, hashtag fake pregnancy and hashtag fake reaching the top 10 hashtags used around the Mexican conversation. The conspiracy even made its way to the documentary Thomas Markle did when someone had become so radicalized by these online conspiracies that they wrote a letter to him. Is Megan really pregnant? Yes. Well, we know that now. <laughs> or is she carrying a fake moon bump? Um, someone else is carrying her baby. That's, like I said, there's four, only, only six pages of <laughs> I'm going to die now, probably because of what's on my finger. Meghan was papped taking Archie to school one week before Princess Charlotte's birthday this year, which the anti-Meghan cults took as a slight towards Charlotte trying to upstage her. I'm not kidding. How did one of these YouTube channels report this story? Meghan attacks six-year-old. All of this is really pretty bottom of the pile, isn't it? We're now talking about somebody seething with rage in her California mansion about a three-year-old and making sure, being hell-bent to ensure that his six-year-old sister doesn't steal the limelight from her son. You cannot make this shit up. It got the fucking clicks though, didn't it? <sighs> They'll analyse videos of happy moments from her childhood and people will make comments saying that these are somehow proof that she's abandoned and discarded her family who clearly loved her because of course, as you all know, in the 90s it was always customary to whip out the VHS camcorder every time you were deep in an argument with a loved one. They're even spreading crazy rumours that Megan once screamed at staff for using egg in a cake and threw hot tea over someone because it wasn't made exactly right and even claims that she's actually physically abused Harry? There are absolutely no sources for this claim in the title of this video. But hey, it doesn't matter, does it? It's got 260,000 views and counting and a 99% like ratio because fuck it, it's probably true, isn't it? This is what happens in the no holds barred world of social media. It's not just YouTube, there are accounts on Instagram and Tumblr that are dedicated to the cause. And I have to say, it's incredible incredibly sad. Put your legs up nice and high in the roast chicken position. <laughs> These are middle-aged women acting like they're in middle school and the hypocrisy is astounding. The same channels will talk about being kind to other people and use the tragic story of Caroline Flack to bolster their messages and then they go on and make multiple negative videos about Megan because they know it will get them clicks. But the other very disturbing thing along with the very overt internalized misogyny from these women was the very covert racism that I saw. For example, there was a statue of Princess Diana which was called the Black Diana statue because it had dark skin and this became the subject of many jokes in the community saying that people thought it was ugly but that Megan would love it of course so she should have it in her back garden and keep it for herself. They found an old CV of hers in which she describes herself as Caucasian so they'll accuse her of being black when it suits her so that she can use the race card to appear as if she's a victim instead of questioning why a mixed raced woman might feel the need to list herself as Caucasian in order to get a job in Hollywood. 
There were further stories about Megan apparently having male traits, insinuating but not going as far to accusing Megan of being secretly transgender. Then they would go on to suggest that Naomi Campbell, who had just given birth at the age of 51, has male traits, so she must have used a surrogate. An accusation which, coincidentally, Serena Williams has dealt with when she got pregnant in 2017, and Beyonce dealt with accusations of faking her most recent pregnancy too. And you also have to ask, why were they so willing to believe a story about Meghan's black mother having previously been to prison? The video's source was a random Russian blog with no sources on it that has now disappeared from the internet, but everyone in the audience believed it so readily. And why are these people willing to believe the white side of Meghan's family over the black side? They say that Meghan isn't representing the royal family and isn't doing her job properly and breaking protocol by wearing the wrong shoes and that's terrible, when it's her and her black mother who were the only ones actually acting like royals and keeping a stiff upper lip the entire time. It's the white side of her family who are going against royal convention and talking trash about her to the press at every goddamn chance they get, yet you're siding with them. I wonder why that is. And these are the people who are clicking on the articles. So they write more articles about the same thing. And the snowball gathers and gathers and gathers. And in the end, misogyny and racism have played a part. And this is what people like Piers don't seem to understand. She comes there from the border of South Central LA, which is one of the most gang infested areas of the world. Clearly, when it was revealed who she was and what her background was, it was an interesting story that that's where she's from. My it university. doesn't make it racist to Here's say that. Or, in the famous words of Socko, Why do you rich fucking white people insist on seeing every socio-political conflict through the myopic lens of your own self-actualization? This isn't about you, so either get with it or get out of the fucking way. The public's insatiable thirst for filling in the gaps of what was said in the Oprah interview was further exploited by this group of channels on YouTube that profess to be able to read whether someone is lying just by analysing their body language. The science behind this is, having researched it, quite honestly, shoddy at best. You can tell by the way that they will subtly suggest that the way Megan touches her nose while answering a question might mean that she's being deceptive, or it might just mean that she's got an itchy nose. But it still leaves enough room for the viewer to decide for themselves. Since the Oprah interview, many of these channels became cesspits for speculation around the interview. And I've been wanting to come for some of these body language channels for a while now, honestly. First of all, let's look at a video by the Behaviour panel. They've got 300,000 subs on YouTube and they've even been invited onto the Dr. Phil show to give their analysis on a guest. And by the way, being affiliated with Dr. Phil in any way is not a good thing. They uploaded a two hour long video which has done very well for them, in which they heavily imply throughout that Meghan was being deceptive in response to many of Oprah's questions, much to the delight of the audience. Yeah, so let me go through the cluster because yeah, you said saw any of one of these things on their own, then you wouldn't be worried about anything. But straight out of the gate here, there is such a big cluster here that you have to go, hang on, that isn't accurate. What you, and also, look, honestly, it, it just begs belief. I, I Google the plumber, okay? And I'm not marrying the plumber, <laughs> okay? So look, we, we Google just about everything. Well, shall we Google you? Mark reckons he is voted number one body language professional in the world for two years running. Why not say which board awarded you this, Mark? Because I can't find proof of this online anywhere. Next, president of the National Communication Coach Association of Canada. I cannot find any proof of the existence of a National Communication Coach Association of Canada anywhere online apart from when it's mentioned in your biography in various places around the internet, Mark. He calls himself a best-selling author, which means fuck all nowadays when you can do it in a very niche section of Amazon very easily. Uh, he reckons his clients include leading business people, teams and politicians, presidents and CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and prime ministers of G7 powers. He doesn't name any of them and provides no proof of this. He is a presentation trainer for the Kellogg Schulich Executive MBA, ranked number one in the world by The Economist. I'm not 
not sure what this MBA is and I can't find any proof of his association with it, but I can confirm that it was actually ranked number nine. Oh, and what a surprise, his Wikipedia page has multiple issues and was apparently written like an advertisement. Shall we go to the talk tab? We love going on the talk tab on Wikipedia, it's, it's always a fun place. Oh, this article is clearly largely BS and I am totally bowled over slash blown away by his lead roles and Academy Awards. Seriously, this was obviously written as a commercial. So who's being fucking deceptive now, Mark? What else have we got? A channel called Believing Bruce. He has a little catchphrase in his videos. And I'm trying to be fair and balanced, yeah, okay? I'm trying to be fair and balanced. Sure, Brucey. Now I know from the research I did on my Tony Robbins video that Believing Bruce uses a lot of NLP techniques in order to read Megan's body language. And we know from my previous research that NLP is mostly bullshit. Oh, Megan. <laughs> oh, Megan, this is quite a, a, an interesting, evocative, uh, maybe slightly inauthentic untruth. And I'm trying to be fair and balanced here. Yeah, I'm trying to be fair and balanced. This guy goes even further and sells his opinions of her body language based on extremely weak science to the tabloids, of course. There are multiple articles citing his findings in which Megan is accused of not caring when visiting the graves of the war heroes. Oh, apparently her tilted head here apparently means that she's bewildered by the memorial. Oh, and the best thing is, when Caroline Flack passed away, he managed to make it sound like he gave a shit about a woman's mental health. Oh, and look, we've again got a woman being accused of being manipulative because she touched her hair. That what we can say without a shadow of a doubt is when Meghan Markle is uncomfortable, that hair gets reframed. Of, of Los Angeles with the riots after the Rodney King beating. And so for these girls to beating. And so for these girls to... She's trying to present herself in a different way and that's coming from discomfort. Who does that remind us of? The hair flipping shit won't work with me either. I'm not that kind of guy. All these people know how to do well is use convincing language to make it sound like they know what they're talking about. That's it, in my opinion. Remember when we got married? You'll see her doing this with her hands. Now that's really a peculiar thing. Like I would remember what I, I do remember when I got married. I don't need a nudge. I don't need that energetic sort of cue to remember the trigger to bring that memory from the neocortex to the, you know, the sort of prefrontal cortex of my brain via the hippocampus to remember. My absolute favorite thing that they do is heavily imply that Megan's lying and then drop a sales pitch to a body language reading course right after. It's just fucking beautiful. As the question I'm thinking is that, was Megan telling the full truth, the actual truth? <laughs> Possibly not. Remember, if you're interested in the art of body language reading, performance psychology, and you're wanting some free resources about it. Yet, when we see a video of a body language analyst who appeared on the Lily Singh show, a body language analyst who has clearly been paid a flat fee for her appearance on the show, so has no reason to upsell or clickbait whatsoever, she happens to be saying that Megan is telling the truth. <laughs> That's a disconnect, right? So what you're saying is that she's telling the truth here. She's telling the truth. She did not do research. She didn't. And her gestures are spot on. Mm -hmm. Her answers are quick. It takes us longer to, to lie. I mean, if we get a difficult question, it makes sense to pause and right. think about how we're going to answer that. And you saw that, like, disgust. But of course, these comments are filled with people saying that she's an actor, so therefore she's good at lying. So good that she can fool a body language expert, of course. To be honest, I don't think this lady knows, and neither do the others. They're all just giving their opinions, and they're about as well informed as ours, in my opinion. You can't tell if someone's lying from their body language, especially if you don't know them. The better you know someone, the more likely you are able to tell if they're lying, but you still don't know 100%. If we were able to tell so easily, criminal trials would be <laughs> a fucking breeze. Anyone here who's binged every JCS video on the planet, and I'm willing to bet a lot of you probably have, will know that the best way to tell whether someone's lying is to just get them to talk and talk can wait until they slip up and create inconsistencies in their story or use a polygraph in order to trick them into thinking that you've caught them lying. I'll let you into a secret, polygraph tests are mostly bullshit too and if you're Chris Watts paired with a brilliant interrogator you've got yourself a confession. Body language barely comes into it whatsoever when it comes to detecting deception. There is no universal body language but that doesn't stop them from guiding these people who are looking for a particular 
particular answer to their desired conclusions. And that's why I don't like body language channels. I'm not saying they're all like that, but be wary. And unfortunately, this isn't the first time that a black woman has been accused of being aggressive, a bully, and manipulative. <laughs> Yes, it does exist, and its flames are fanned by the press. Racists exist here, and we find them at times when they get caught out, such as when the leader of one of the largest political parties in the UK's girlfriend was caught out sending messages in which she said her seed will taint our royal family and pave the way for a black king. Other black women who have become victims of the bullying stereotype in the UK include Keisha Buchanan of the Sugar Babes, who the press wrongly reported bullied other members of the girl group, going as far to say that the member of the group that eventually replaced her when she got kicked out of the band said she was terrified of her, all of which turned out to be a complete fabrication. Then there was Misha B on The X Factor, another black woman who was publicly accused on primetime Saturday night television of bullying other contestants. You being so feisty can come across quite mean to certain contestants and I've been told by a few contestants this week that there's been a few mean comments towards them. And of course the tabloids went wild which ended up with Misha having suicidal thoughts and in a decade of therapy. We nationally mourned Prince Philip recently, an old man who it's been widely reported as having said, you are a woman aren't you? If you stay here much longer you'll be all slitty eyed. Aren't most of you descended from pirates? It looks as if it was put in by an Indian. Still throwing spears? Oh but that's okay, he's an old man, he was only joking. Of course. But then believing a mixed-raced woman when she says that there'd been remarks about the potential colour of a baby's skin within that same family? Fucking outrageous! It's a beautiful photograph taken back in 2018, several of the grandchildren, of course, before Archie was born uh, to Meghan and Harry. And I, I wonder if Meghan has managed to take offence at this photograph that doesn't include her son, who she probably thinks it's a racist photograph taken before her son was even conceived, but I'm sure she's managed to take offence at it anyway. She ain't living in your head rent-free anymore. She's bought real estate and built a condominium in your frontal lobe. <laughs> Ah, internalised misogyny. To understand how this phenomenon is deeply entwined within the press, we need to understand the history of the UK's most read tabloid newspaper, the Daily Mail. With an average readership of 58, and the only newspaper with over half of the readership female, middle-aged women are the most targeted for clicks. Despite its notorious past of proven lies, unreliability, sensationalism and inaccurate scare stories about science and medical research, and generally regarded as untrustworthy, it remains the most read tabloid in the UK, both online and in print. When newspapers for the lower middle class came into wider circulation at the end of the 19th century, the Daily Mail emerged and immediately recognised the female market as its target. It was launched by journalist Alfred Harmsworth in 1896, and he made it clear to the Conservative Party that the newspaper would provide loyal support against the movement towards social change and was a passionate supporter for the British Empire. He was later ennobled as Viscount Northcliffe. Northcliffe's pursuit of the female audience was far more consistent and committed than previous exponents of popular journalism, and it was his success that ensured the male's competitors soon followed its lead. After 1896, Northcliffe moved the female reader from the margins to the centre of the editorial calculations, ensuring that the definition of news was radically altered and the boundary between public and private was redrawn, and that the visibility of women in public discourse was transformed. More than a century later, the Mail is still known for its skill in attracting female readers. The Daily Mail has reluctantly modernised in the face of inevitable social change, but is more underhand in its approach towards pushing its conservative agenda on women. A man called Paul Dacre was the editor of the Daily Mail from 1992 to 2018. Nothing is published in the Daily Mail that he hasn't personally approved, a former employee says. He looks at, changes, rips up every page. You can assume everything that is published is 
entirely consistent with his philosophy. He's very right-wing and proud of it, says another former male staffer, and he's a ferociously committed family man. He simply believes from the bottom of his heart that, that children should be with their mothers and it's wrong for women to be away from their children. He's an incredibly private family man and he has a very rigid moral code of conduct about how he thinks people should live their lives. And the paper still hasn't shaken off the stink of Dacre or its past. You might remember in part one I mentioned the headline, Never mind Brexit, who won Lexit? Which is a terrible pun at best, and at worst, a crippling realisation that this front page headline was signed off by a newspaper editor in the year 2017. But why? There seems to be an inherent tendency for women to compare themselves with other women. This can be seen on the infamous Daily Mail sidebar in which 99% of clickbait stories involve pictures of women showing off their post-baby bodies or their revenge bods after breakups or whichever other word vomit they can come up with. The articles are mostly written by women and in turn women readers make their own lives more difficult by clicking on these stories. But who do we blame? The chicken or the egg? Do we blame society or the Daily Mail for profiting out of being an unflattering mirror blindingly reflecting our worst insecurities and prejudices right back in our faces? A man called Geordie Gregg overtook Dacre's role in 2018 and he wishes to detoxify the paper but in his words, support for Brexit is in the DNA of both the Daily Mail and more pertinently its readers. Any move to reverse this would be editorial and commercial suicide and you could probably safely assume that the rest of Dacre's views won't be going anywhere anytime soon for fear of lost profits. And of course the man overseeing the second most popular tabloid in the UK is Rupert Murdoch, quite possibly the most influential man in the world, who, when Charlotte Church was a mere 12 years old, managed to get her to waive a £100,000 payment for a performance at his wedding on his private yacht in return for good press. At 12, Charlotte wanted to take the cash to spend on Pokemon cards, but her management told her that the good press would be worth it in the long run, knowing how relentless Murdoch's empire could be. But being advised by management and by certain members of the record company um, to take the latter option that he was a very very powerful man I was in the early stages of my career and could absolutely do with a favor of this magnitude and yeah I sang I sang at the ceremony yes that's right an octogenarian billionaire swindled free labor out of a 12 year old girl by threatening to ruin her fucking life However, the son did not keep their side of the deal and salivated over her changing body as she went through puberty, published a countdown clock to her reaching the age of consent, and then at the age of 16 she was branded rare of the year, and they reported on her mother's suicide attempt and splashed news of her pregnancy across the press before she'd even told her own family, which they had learnt by hacking her voicemail. Another tragic case study is Caroline Flagg, a woman who hosted shows mostly watched by women so attracted the opinions of many women in the press and online. Labelled a floozy for apparently flirting with Love Island contestants where a man flirting with women in that same position probably would have been lauded as a cheeky player. That X Factor experience for both of us was, was, was hard, you know, but again Caroline God, she got it so much more than me. I don't know what it was. She never settled down with one man, so her various flings were relentlessly covered in the press, garnering well-deserved judgment when she dated the then 17-year-old Harry Styles and coincidentally even briefly dated Prince Harry before she quickly realised that she couldn't deal with the press intrusion. Caroline was never able to deal well with heartbreak or negative public opinion of her. Tragically, when they both happened at once and she was arrested for allegedly smashing a lamp over her boyfriend's head, it hit the front pages immediately and Caroline was trialled in the press-run court of opinion before any unbiased court trial was able to take place, with men's rights groups jumping on the chance to label her a domestic abuser. She had lost her dream job on Love Island, the public hated her and she wasn't allowed to see her boyfriend. Her life, in her eyes, was over, whichever way the court trial turned out. The front page was splashed with images of her blood-stained bedsheet sheets, implying that this was the result of Caroline's attack on her boyfriend. However, it later transpired that the blood was Caroline's own due to injuries that were self-inflicted. The press 
have a talent of deflecting blame away from themselves every time they've played a part in someone's death, however, and the newspapers turned their vitriol to the Crown Prosecution Service and criticised them for pursuing the case, i.e. doing their jobs. Back in 1997, after the death of Diana, the tabloids turned attention away from themselves and the photographers that they purchased pictures from and towards the royal family themselves, who they accused of not publicly mourning good enough. Since that fateful day, the tabloids ceased purchasing any pictures from paparazzi that were taken in vehicular pursuit in an apparent respect for her. But that doesn't mean the press has stopped killing women, royal or otherwise. Now they just do it with a thousand cuts. Women who are assertive or forceful, aka intent on pursuing their dreams and achieving their goals, are perceived as 35% less competent than non-assertive women according to a 2015 Vital Smart study. And one Stanford University paper which compared employees with certain masculine traits, like being aggressive, assertive and confident, with feminine traits such as acting like a lady, found that women can't step outside of their traditional role without making waves or experiencing a backlash. The situation is even worse for women of colour. Black women are not supposed to push back and when they do, they're deemed to be domineering, aggressive, threatening, loud. With this in mind, it makes sense that so many people balk when Meghan refuses to bow down to the rules and that so many people experienced an irrational hatred of her from the very moment she confidently sat down for her engagement interview with Prince Harry. They would have preferred her to bashfully bat away compliments, to let him do all the talking for her, to insist that she's far more mediocre than what the world gives her credit for. To be cowed, simpering and full of self-loathing. To flush red with embarrassment whenever she was asked her opinion on the matter of her impending marriage. In other words, exactly how Princess Diana was. Which is something that Kate, in her own way, has managed to emulate. Kate had no truly established career or public opinions of her own before being blasted into the spotlight when she met William. We could project this Diana-esque image onto her easily of a shy and retiring woman whose only real purpose is to look pretty and provide heirs to the throne. The poor woman probably does have a thriving personality, but the depressing truth is that she's done her job well by managing to keep it under wraps. In the words of Hilary Mantel, I was asked to name a famous person and choose a book to give them. I chose Kate, and I chose to give her a book called Queen of Fashion, What Marie Antoinette Wore to the Revolution. It's not that I think we're heading for a revolution, it's rather that I saw Kate becoming a jointed doll on which certain rags are hung. In those days she was a shop window mannequin with no personality of her own, entirely defined by what she wore. These days she is a mother-to-be and draped in another set of threadbare attributions. And when royal women transgress away from this image, the back clash is evident. Fergie, who entered the royal family when she married Prince Andrew in 1986, was popular and lauded in the tabloids. That was until she dared to reveal that she had a personality and was then accused of being a bad influence on Diana after a few public displays of horseplay, even though, to me at least, it seemed clear that Fergie was the only source of joy and escape from the loveless marriage that she was pushed into. The press even played their own part in pushing Diana into her doomed marriage by telling her that she'd be left left alone once engaged and then when that promise was broken she was told she'd be left alone once she was married. She'd only met Charles 13 times previous to her wedding day. The only way of connecting with the public in the days of Diana was via the press and being a savvy, intelligent woman she learnt how to spin a positive public image but she also had the advantage, similar to how Kate does now, of being seen as a young virginal blank canvas which we can paint our personal ideals onto. And throughout all of this, you may be asking, but what of Prince Andrew? Well, he lost his duties and he lost his public funding and now has his security funded by the Queen's private money. He's certainly not popular, in fact he is the least popular member of the royal family. And Epstein wasn't the only controversy he was involved with. He's been accused of being close friends with the alleged corrupt leader and human rights abuser Ilham Aliyev and spending £620,000 of public money in one year just on travel and hotels for his trade envoy role. But the truly depressing reality is that he has the privilege of just being forgotten because he's a man. We don't allow women to be forgotten and cast out of the spotlight. Whether the backlash to their actions is justified or not, once a woman has transgressed in our eyes, we do not allow them to live it down. It gets added to the list of previous transgressions and women decide that they hate them, more articles are written about them and the women click on them again and the cycle continues. 
And through this, the tabloid machine has caused an almost fatal situation yet again. We have arrived at the crux of the matter. A royal lady is a royal vagina. Along with the reverence and awe accorded to the royal persons goes the conviction that the body of the monarch is public property. We are ready at any moment to rip away the veil of respect and treat royal persons in an inhuman way, making them not more than us, but less than us. Not really human at all. It may be that the whole phenomenon of monarchy is irrational, but that doesn't mean that when we look at it we should behave like spectators at bedlam. Cheerful curiosity can easily become cruelty. It can easily become fatal. We don't cut off the heads of royal ladies these days, but we do sacrifice them. And we did, memorably, drive one to destruction a scant generation ago. History makes fools of us, makes puppets of us, often enough. But it doesn't have to repeat itself. In the current case, much lies within our control. The royal family are stuck between this impossible dichotomy of appearing elusive yet of the people at the same time. But what even is their point anymore if they can't be used to our advantage? We chuck millions of pounds at one family who happen to be descended from the most notorious tyrants and then we get angry at them for not spending our money correctly. We ridicule them for spending their own money on their own possessions as they aren't meant to outwardly appear wealthy to us. Yet as soon as they suggest that they're struggling with their mental health, all of a sudden, they aren't one of us. They have no problems. That's that's impossible! They live in a palace! Ironically, this is probably the only thing that we actually have in common with these people. We've all got the same wobbly pink blob of blamange in there. They're supposed to bring us together across political divides, but this situation has only divided us further. What happens when we have a member of the royal family who is gay, trans, or non-binary? We've only got more ugly truths to uncover still. This could happen as soon as Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis grow up. The world is modernizing much faster than the institution. There have been at least some attempts by William and Kate to move into the modern world with the recent inception of a YouTube channel. I don't get why people like Kate and William so much. I mean, I think they're okay, but they seem to be so popular because they're modernizing the royal family, but at this extremely slow snail rate that most boomers are able to deal with. Oh, look, Kate was a commoner. Wow, William is the perfect future king. He's so modern for not finding his wife on 23andMe. This YouTube channel isn't really giving an insight into their lives. It's not like they're going to start family vlogging or anything. For a start, they're not exploiting their children anywhere near enough. Here's some ideas for you. Dropping future king prank. Kate cried, Bree abdicated. Louis invades Charlotte's bedroom and knocks down all of her Lego. I must admit, I tend to enjoy all of the pomp and circumstance surrounding the royal weddings, but I can't shake that horrible conspiracy in my head that all of this is just to desperately maintain a class status quo, and what we're really cheering is all the billionaires and millionaires who don't pay their taxes and lobby the fuck out of our politicians to benefit themselves. And that's why the billionaire-owned tabloids fight so hard to keep the institution stable and villainize anyone who attempts to modernize it. Yeah, we did kind of spend £850 billion of your money to bail out the bankers after their own carelessness tanked our economy, creating a worldwide financial crash that hit the poor the hardest. But uh, look at this pretty woman. Ah, oh, ooh, look at this woman. Ooh, isn't she terrible? Now she's done something else terrible. Oh dear. Look at the way that she touches her pregnant belly. Oh dear. But how do we stop all of this from happening again? Do we make manufactured consent by Noam Chomsky compulsory curriculum material for all school children? Now that would put an entire generation off reading. Maybe we should just make the national anthem this instead. Because this man's 
Victoria. 